talking real estate. We have a special guest speaker, Amanda Hoyle of Metro Study, who will present the latest state of play with our residential and commercial real estate markets. After Amanda's presentation, we'll have a panel discussion with leaders from Grub Properties, Ram Realty Advisors, and Weaver Street Realty. After the panel, we'll go to you and have a discussion among participants. We will do this all in 90 quick minutes, so buckle up. <laughs> Before we get the program started, a few housekeeping items. First, uh, staffing. As far as staffing for today's Zoom discussion, I'll serve as your host. Erin Nelson will be your MC. Jensen Anderson is on slides and Vanessa Watson is on technology. So Vanessa will apply her quick ninja moves if we have any Zoom hackers. <laughs> If you have any questions or comments during this forum, I encourage you to post them in the chat box, which is below. I'll be monitoring that throughout the event and help queue up your questions. Uh, you probably noticed as you joined the conversation that you are muted, and uh, we ask that you keep your line muted throughout the duration until you're invited to speak. Uh, if you're comfortable, though, please do share your video. We love to see your smiling faces. Today's discussion will be recorded and it'll be shared on our YouTube channel and then the slides that are presented will be shared on SlideShare. We'll send you the links to both uh, in our follow-up email after the event. This forum, like many of our forums, is free for chamber members. So if you're not a chamber member but you're interested in learning more, just drop a note in the chat box and my colleague Rebecca Dickinson or one of our other staff members will be sure to follow up with you. Today's forum and the entire 2020 policy series is coordinated by the Chamber's Government Affairs Committee. The, cham uh, excuse me, the chair of the Government Affairs Committee, Betsy Brucker Harris, would like to bring you welcome. Betsy is the IT project coordinator of Armacell, which is a global company that invented flexible foam and manufactures innovative technical insulation solutions that conserve energy and make a positive difference. Armacell has 300 patents and 3,000 employees and 24 facilities around the world, including their head office for the Americas in Chapel Hill and a manufacturing facility in Mebane. Betsy? Thank you, Katie. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, my computer does this a lot. I think I've unmuted. I hope you can all hear me. Um, on behalf of our 27 volunteer members of the Chamber's Government Affairs Committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth forum of the year, the Real Estate Forum. For those of, us, or for those of you who haven't joined us before, um, you should know that we're a learning community. While you may be tempted to just sit back, relax, uh, we encourage you to lean into this conversation, pose questions, engage in the discussion. Um, we're also a social group. So we invite you to share your ahas in the chat box there in Zoom and to tweet your favorite takeaways on Twitter with the hashtag, hashtag CHC Policy Series. Um, it's a pleasure to serve on the Government Affairs Committee and to help coordinate these forums. Our committee also convenes every month to discuss policy matters and to coordinate our collective advocacy on behalf of the Chamber. Uh, in this committee, we focus on four things, retaining, recruiting, and growing employers, developing a talented workforce, improving our business climate and regulatory environment, and building and maintaining infrastructure. If you're interested in being a part of this 2021 slate of nominees for our committee, I invite you to let me know or let Katie know of your interest. Uh, we'd be glad to discuss the committee roles and responsibilities with you. And with that, I hope you enjoy the program. Back to you, Katie. Thanks, Betsy. And one other housekeeping thing I forgot to mention, um, the program works really nicely if you put your view in speaker view instead of gallery so that you can really see our speakers. It should be at the top of your screen. Well, today's forum would not be possible without the 2020 Policy Series sponsors, Durham Technical Community College, Duke Energy, and Silver Spot Cinema. Let's meet them. We'll start with Durham Tech. Durham Tech is the community college that serves our workforce here in Orange County. They have a beautiful 20 acre, 40,000 square foot campus centrally located in Orange County near Hillsboro. And when you think of Durham Tech's Orange County campus, think three things, healthcare pipeline, small business support, and university transfer programming. 
With us today is their new president, J.B. Buxton. J.B. is a longtime leader of public education in North Carolina. He was a White House fellow. He is on the State Board of Education and is now the fifth president of Durham Tech. J.B., we're glad to have you. Please bring welcome to our participants. Katie, thank you very much. And to you and Aaron, thanks for your leadership. I, I've got to tell you, as the new president, I'm selling a house in Raleigh and buying a house in Durham. So that's primarily why I'm here today. I want to learn about the residential market. Uh, <laughs> but I appreciate very much what this chamber does to not only position us to survive this pandemic and, and economic time, but help us come out the other side and thrive. And I would say at Durham Tech, we're acutely aware uh, of our role in helping power what's going to be a comeback in this region for Durham and Orange. I think we're acutely aware of the opportunities we have because of the sectors that are still vibrant in our economy in this region. I think we feel fortunate. We're also acutely aware of the lack of economic mobility that too often has characterized this region and feel strongly that we're an institution that will help support true upward economic mobility as we come through this pandemic and through a tough economic in time of racial equity and discrimination. So we look forward to working with all of you. Uh, we are happy to provide real estate broker courses, pre-licensing and post-licensing at Durham Tech and be part of this real estate market, uh, but really appreciate what all the leadership of this community does to support e upward economic mobility for all our residents in Durham and Orange County and look forward to the information today. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, JB. It's great to have you at the helm of Durham Tech and uh, to have you moving closer, uh, closer by. Um, our second sponsor is Duke Energy, and you should know that Duke Energy is one of the largest energy holding companies in the United States. They provide power to nearly 10 million customers across half a dozen states. They were named one of the world's most admired companies by Fortune Magazine in 2020, and one of America's best employers by Forbes in 2019. They are working hard to build a smarter energy future and we appreciate their support for these thoughtful events. Our third and final sponsor of the program is Silver Spot Cinema. Our policy series regulars know that we normally hold these forums in person at Silver Spot, uh, where we can sink into their enormous leather reclining chairs and view the presentations on the big screen. It's awesome. Unfortunately, the pandemic is limiting our ability to enjoy their venue as a group, but uh, please keep them in mind for your own organization's 2021 programming when it's safe to do so. They're an upscale boutique movie theater that offers very sophisticated, professional meeting experiences, and we appreciate their partnership on this series. All right, now onto the program. As I mentioned before, the Chamber President and CEO, Aaron Nelson, will emcee our program today. Aaron has led the Chamber for nearly 20 years. He's a Carolina grad, and he's always quick with a joke or an insightful comment. <laughs> Aaron, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, we'll see what kind of wit we can bring uh, this morning. We're glad to have everybody. Uh, many of you I enjoyed uh, uh, last night seeing you at the Orange County's uh, public hearing uh, that went on for a good five hours last night. So thank you everybody as they considered a $150 million investment um, between here and Hillsborough called RTLP. More on that if you have questions later. Uh, today, we have a strong program. It's gonna be broken into three segments. Segment one will be a presentation from Amanda Hoyle of Metro Study, who is back by popular demand. I think this is her third time. After the first one, we said, oh, we have got to do that again. And so she, immediately following this one, uh, we will ask if she will also come see us again uh, next year. Amanda is gonna talk about the current state of play with commercial and residential markets, share some of her predictions for the months ahead. Uh, segment two is gonna be a panel conversation where we're gonna get some reactions from some key real estate leaders, also some updates on projects that they are working on here in our market. And segment three will be for uh, questions from the floor. So be thinking about what questions you have, either type them in the chat and Katie will ask them for you or we'll call on you. Uh, as we do, we are packing 10 pounds of fun into a five pound bag, y'all. So there's going to be some hustle to this. So let's get started. First will be Amanda Hoyle. She's the regional director for Metro Study. They are a Hanley Wood company. They provide market intelligence, research, analysis, and consulting for nearly every major industry. Y'all builders, developers, financial institutions, manufacturers, retailers, telecommunicators, the folks <laughs> in government, others all rely on Metro Study and their research. 
And we are grateful uh, to have an award-winning journalist. Uh, you may remember her from her time at the Triangle Business Journal, uh, Amanda, now working for Metro Study to give her presentation. Amanda, welcome. Thank you, Aaron. I'm excited to be back and um, hopefully we won't have a lot of the same technical difficulties we'd had at last year. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and try to uh, get my screen geared up and let me switch over. That looks All right. Great. That look good? Yes. And for those of you out there, you have a little slider bar in the middle that will allow you to move left and right to see a little bit more of the presentation and to make Amanda slightly smaller, if you wish. Okay. <laughs> uh, and remember, uh, looking at it in the speaker view is our preferred approach. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. And um, I thank you again for inviting me back. Um, I'm going to kind of go ahead and jump in because we've got a lot to cover. There's a lot that's happening in the real estate markets. And I know that, that there's going to be a lot of questions at the end. And I'm really excited to hear from the panelists afterwards. Just a little bit more about who we are. Uh, we do provide data research primarily for the home building market, but we also have um, experts with our Myers Research Advisory Team that can provide market studies for commercial real estate projects, mixed use, apartments, um, housing, if you're looking to buy land, master plan development, or if you know someone who's involved in this, that's kind of who our go to, we are kind of those go-to people when you want to make sure that you want to sanity check a project, for example, to make sure that it's going to work um, with your development partners, with your financial institutions and everything going forward. Let us be a partner with that. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to me directly um, and I can provide you more information about that. Uh, going forward, these are some free events that our company actually has that we're opening up to the to the, to the to the world, essentially. We've been hosting every month a COVID housing outlook our next one is actually this afternoon. You can sign up for it. It's with our, our own chief economist, Allie Wolf, and um, Tim Sullivan with our Myers research team. And they walk us through what is happening on a national level on the housing side. So a lot of the information I'm going to be presenting is actually things that Allie and Tim have talked about in the past. And so they will be updating some of the information on the national level um, with their meeting this afternoon. And if you are involved in home building at all, you'll definitely want to participate in our Future Place event that's coming up in October and the Builder 100 event coming up in November. You can get more details. Um, if you need more details, I can show you where to go to on the, on the correct websites. So today's agenda, I'm gonna kind of start off talking a little bit of an overview about where we are in our economy because I would definitely call this one of the most confusing economies of our time. And then I'll kind of briefly kind of go through what's going on with the commercial real estate markets. Then I'll dive into more of the housing markets and a little bit of looking ahead and then we'll be able to kind of wrap it up with the panel discussion and some Q&A afterwards. So starting us off, uh, the most confusing economy of our time. Uh, so right now, you know, when you look at the overall employment in the Triangle region, the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that we were at our lowest point in April and May when our job market was down about 123,000 jobs uh, compared to a year ago. Since then, we have recovered about 41,000 of those jobs in August, and we were down only about 82,000 um, as of the August report. Our forward-looking forecast right now shows that our market will probably be down about 18,000 jobs by the end of the year, but uh, I'm sorry, about 63,000 jobs by the end of the year. Uh, but we should be able to completely recover all of those jobs to, and probably add another 18,000 by the end of 2021 um, if we're able to successfully mass produce this safe vaccine for the coronavirus. Because when you do look at the local jobs, jobs by sector, almost no one has been spared. Leisure and hospitality, of course, has taken the brunt of the shutdowns. Um, the, this industry used to employ about 100,000 people in the Triangle region. It was cut nearly in half in April, and we're still down about 30% in August compared to a year ago in that particular sector. There's also this growing concern that of this impending wave of so-called silent failures among the small business community because the swiftness of this pandemic and the huge drop in the economy is hitting hard among some of these typically upbeat entrepreneurs. Many of these are family-owned businesses. They're not even filing for bankruptcy or defaulting on any loans. They're just moving their inventory into storage and calling the power company to turn off the power. But the good news for the triangle, at least, is that our top three employment sectors that account for more than half of all of our jobs 
government, professional, ser professional business services, trade and transportation, they are collectively down only about 3% each. And so stability in these sectors bodes very well for a quicker rebound in our overall economy and ultimately in the survival of some of these small companies. And of course, I have to note that the construction industry has been one of the bright spots that we've all needed in these quarantine lives as work on our houses and our commercial buildings is proven to help keep this economic, economic engine pumping. Uh, construction right now is the only job sector in the triangle that is showing any year over year growth up about 1.2% as of August. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more later about why we're seeing such growth in the construction industry, but also why we might still need to be cautious about this sector for a while. So this somewhat stabilization on the employment side is leading to somewhat of a recovery on the unemployment numbers as well. Um, in Raleigh-Durham, the unemployment rate peaked at about 11.5% May compared to a US average at that time that was about 13%. By June, that rate had dropped back down to 7% and was back up a little bit at 8% in July. Um, but when we're looking at the implied employment rate, which is what the employment rate would have been taken into the account, the extensions of the employment insurance, that employment level is actually closer to about 6%, which ranks the triangle among the healthiest metro areas in the country when it comes to employment, besting even Charlotte, Austin, Dallas, and Atlanta. And a recent Moody's analytics report even ranked the triangle market among the best positioned regions in the country to recover from the effects of this virus induced recession. Our region took not one, but two of the top 10 spots on this list as Durham was recognized for its potential for as a strong, highly educated college town, Raleigh was recognized for its fast growing tech hub. And the author of this report, Adam Camus put it, those economies that can provide the high paying jobs to would be city residents are especially well positioned for recovery coming out of this pandemic. And it's our belief that the Triangle region has much to benefit from the groundwork that has already been laid in a lot of these sectors. And it doesn't hurt that we are at the heart of so much of the research that's being funded to secure the new treatments and the testing method methods for the coronavirus. North Carolina ranks sixth nationally in federal research allocations with 90% of those dollars going to either Duke, UNC, or NC State. And since the outbreak, only two organizations have received more COVID-19 funding than the researchers at UNC Chapel Hill. That's the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill, as many of us know, is home to some of the top experts in the world. And it's uh, currently ranked the highest ranked US, US university for the coronavirus vaccine uh, research. One of UNC's most notable contributions, of course, was their partnership with Gilead Sciences to develop the drug remdesivir, which has been one of the go-to most effective drugs in treating COVID-19. But outside of the universities, more than a dozen research triangle companies and research labs are directly answering calls to help solve this global challenge by attacking it from all angles. Our contract research, research organizations like RTI um, and, and Iquivia have used their experience with public health threats to help lead some of the studies so we can better understand what is happening with this. Durham's uh, Velocity Clinical Research is receiving multi-site awards for five of the phase three COVID-19 vaccine studies with already more than 10,000 people volunteering to start testing some of these, these products that they're gonna be using. And probably the more, one of the more high profile is the Novavax partnership with Fujifilm, Diosynth, and RTP, which President Trump visited a few weeks ago. This is one of the um, more viewed as one of the more promising candidates in the coming months with batches of this vaccine being created at the RTP site that's gonna be used in its phase three file, in the phase three trials. So even in the best of times, these high tech companies are a pillars, are pillars of our community and our economy. But in the wake of this pandemic, they are literally our lifesavers right now. So, but we have to remember that not all parts of the economy are recovering at the same rate. Our chief economist, Ali Wolf, is calling this the K economy. Um, on the top half, we have industries like the housing markets, which make up about 16% of GDP, work from home providers like Zoom, we talked about that, even the stock market that have enjoyed a full V recovery and then some. But at the bottom half of that K economy, we have the others who are struggling, the travel and tourism industry, event centers, really any business that depends on social contact among family and friends. Because, uh, because if you think about how our spending habits have changed, sales of beer, wine, and liquor are up 21%. 
Building materials and supplies are up 15%, mostly from all the home improvement projects we've been tackling. Online shopping is up 25%, but sales of gas stations are down 16% because we're not commuting and driving as much. Restaurants and bars are down 19%. Fashion and clothes are down 30%. Um, Yelp, the online review company, has recently published a report that shows that almost 98,000 businesses nationally that had shut down temporarily due to COVID have now permanently shuttered since March 1st. About 60,000 of those were local businesses or firms with fewer than five locations. And so while these, many of these are small individually, the collective impact of these failures could be substantial. So how are these changes affecting our commercial real estate markets? Um, you know, right now on the corporate side, there's been a lot of speculation and mixed messages about the future corporate office space and how companies will grow into the future. And a recent survey by Site Selectors Guild, whose membership includes many of the top site selection consultants around the country who work with companies to decide where they want and need to relocate and expand their businesses. And what this, this survey of these guild members showed us is that uh, suburban and mid-sized cities like our own will likely be the biggest winners of the new corporate expansions and relocations with urban areas falling really toward the bottom of the list. They've noted that everything from physical distancing to changing transit preferences has affected the way that corporations are now viewing location decisions. Um, the study also asked the consultants to name specific locations that would be strong candidates for new projects in the next year. And our triangle region was among the regions that, ha that was mentioned among those top 11. And the industries that are seeing the most project activity are those that we've been targeting for many years already, biotech and life sciences, advanced, advanced manufacturing and IT. I think the USGA's recent announcement of its plans to bring the, many of their corporate operations and the new R&D facility to Pinehurst next year really fits the bill of what we're gonna start seeing among a lot of the slightly relocations that are happening around the country. But this recession has increased pressure on many businesses to shore up their finances and trying to eliminate expensive office leases or selling properties is one way that they're using to boost the cash. Um, many of us have seen the story in San Francisco where Pinterest decided to terminate a lease that it had already signed for a 490,000 square foot building um, near its current headquarters. Uh, to break that deal, it meant that Pinterest had to pay nearly $90 million to the developers of that project. But it also meant that Pinterest would not be on the hook for about 440 million in, minim in minimum lease payments over the course of the terms of that agreement if they had gone through with it. Uh, in Seattle, the outdoor clothing and gear retailer RAI had spent the last two years building an elaborate new gorgeous headquarters building with outdoor staircases, a courtyard, skylights to let the sunshine and air in. But once the pandemic hit, the company started looking at other options. Remote work for its employees seemed to be working and maybe they didn't need this big building. So they put it up on the market and decided to instead open a number of smaller offices and allow many of their employees to continue to work from home remotely. Um, and even closer to home, co-working giant WeWork has had barely moved into the new 300 Morris building on the Durham ID campus in downtown Durham. They signed a lease about two years ago for 74,000 square feet across three floors, and already they've decided to vacate the space. Um, WeWork still has offices open at the one city center tower in Durham and another in downtown Raleigh, but they, there just wasn't enough demand to also have this third location. But that this false storyline that does keep cropping up that companies are abandoning large swaths of office space, we are just not seeing that on a large scale yet. Yes, there is uncertainty that, the, that is clouding the picture right now, but big tech companies and little tech companies are continuing to drive commercial real estate markets during the pandemic as they are now able to actually take advantage of some of these opportunities that are opening up in the market. Um, Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg was among those CEOs proclaiming that remote workers will be the wave of the future and that he expects half of his company's employees will be working remotely permanently within the next decade. But then Facebook turns around and buys that beautiful REI headquarters building in Seattle paying nearly $370 million to expand their engineering teams up there. And Facebook has committed to a giant lease um, for about 730,000 square feet in New York City. Amazon also continues to expand all over the place, working to hire hundreds more workers for a new distribution hub and carry. That's in, an, in addition to the ginormous new fulfillment center that they just opened off of I-40 and Garner. 
and even Art Pope, the king of the roses discount chain, is finding opportunities to grow as some of its competitors have started to stumble. But for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Um, anchor retailers like Sears and JCPenney had, they were struggling already even before the pandemic hit. And this seems to just have been the nail in the coffin for both of these companies and others similar to them. Um, but these new vacant retail buildings are also prime locations for other retailers and other um, real estate uses like Amazon um, who can come and to capitalize on the proximity to their own customer base. And why not? I mean, these stores are in highly dense areas with large parking lots and lots of floor space. And so, I mean, that's kind of what we're thinking is that a lot of these spaces are gonna be zapped up because of their great locations and we're not gonna be seeing them languishing for, for too, too long. Likewise, another casualty um, has been social, to social distancing has been that many of our favorite inline retail shops and restaurants. Um, but what we're seeing happening is retailers and landlords working together to come up with more creative solutions to better utilize these outdoor spaces and parking lots that were not being fully utilized before. And the rationale behind that is the rebuilding retail around these safe experiences, which is really something that can never be duplicated online. So I think we're going to see more of this happening across all of our markets. And fortunately, retailers and property owners all across Chapel Hill and Carver are already in that, this mindset that outdoor public spaces should be used as places to gather and to support the nearby businesses and their customers. The town's outgoing, uh, ongoing negotiations with Grove Properties to redevelop the 100, the 100 block of East Rosemary Street is a great example of how public and private sectors are trying to work together to create more modern and safe spaces for businesses to grow in the downtown district. And I'm sure we're gonna be hearing a little bit more of that from Joe Dye on our panel discussion a little bit. Um, JP Morgan Chase recognized this commitment as well, deciding last year to open its very first Chase Bank branch in North Carolina with a site on Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. Ram Realty Advisors is, is moving forward now with their proposed transformation of the university place. Hotel operator Adventurous Journeys Capital Partners recognized an opportunity when it bought the 69 room Franklin Hotel for $20 million last year, transformed it into the recently renovated Graduate Hotel last year. And real estate investors, Agri Realty Corporation of Michigan saw this too, um, agreeing to pay $32 million just last week for the new Wegmans super grocery site on Fordham Boulevard. And the Wegmans store isn't even gonna be finished until next spring. So this just shows that everyone, that there is still a lot of bullishness about what is happening in the Chapel Hill and Carborough area among the real estate industry. So we've talked about the impact on the economy and what it's had on commercial real estate and how is it affecting the housing market. And I am going to be honest with you that back in March and April, when I was preparing my notes for the meetings I was having with our home builder clients back in the spring, I was preparing for the worst. For sure, there was no way that people at risk of losing their jobs because of the uncertainty around the pandemic and the, and the recession could choose to take on this added risk of a new or bigger mortgage. And for sure, there was no way that people were going to move forward with plans to buy a home if they couldn't even tour the properties in person. Um, but I could not really have been more wrong. And as were many of the other economists who were trying to make their predictions for the rest of this weird and crazy year, the housing market has been able to bounce back seemingly following this V-shaped recovery and actually growing above and beyond our sales pace from last year, at least so far. It helps that the housing market has been propped up by a number of factors that led to this perfect storm, a stock market that's been able to retain its strength, a lack of resale inventory options that, that has unwittingly pushed more buyers toward looking at new home products instead, seriously low uh, mortgage interest rates, favorable demographics, and the fact that most of the job losses have been in those, in, in those employment sectors that are typically below that normal new home buyer income levels. This pandemic event has actually accelerated many buyers' plans to look for a new home as our lifestyles and our patterns of our day-to-day -day tasks have changed in light of this new virtually connected environment. So it really has been a wake up for the whole another audience of potential home buyers that might have otherwise continued to sit on the sidelines for a few more years. And so which is one of, with one of the key factors at the top of that list is the fact that mortgage rates are at this historic lows, right at 2.87% as of the last week. And they're really not expected to change much up or down in the foreseeable future. 
The Federal Reserve has pledged its economic aid in keeping interest rates low for as long as it takes. And this bodes well for anyone who might be thinking of moving out of that apartment or mom and dad's house and investing in their own home or upgrading into something a little bit bigger that'll be able to suit their family a little bit more. But to say that the market has not was not prepared for the sudden surge is putting it mildly. Our inventory level of homes available for purchase has been nearly wiped out. Um, as soon as a reasonably priced home comes to market, it's likely to have solid offers within days, if not multiple offers within hours. Closed sales year to date for the Triangle region was up about 3.1%, but it would be much higher if our inventory levels could just catch up. Right now, many people are afraid to, um, is keep, what's keeping it down is some people are afraid to let strangers in the home to tour, and they're likewise afraid that even if they do get a good offer, they might not be able to find that suitable replacement home to move into. So it's sort of that chicken and egg thing. And right now, inventory levels are down about 45% from where it was a year ago with only 1.3 months of supply. That's it. Uh, so here's a chart also tracking the number of real estate showings that are being booked through showing time going back to January. This is a scheduling software program that many of the local real estate associations across the state recommend and use. And you can see that huge dip in the showings interest back in March and April. But as the restrictions have started to loosen again in May, the appointment levels recovered quickly and are even now exceeding levels than what we were seeing last year. For Orange County, it's a similar story, but inventory here has been so tight for so long that there, that there really is no room for growth right now. Closed sales in Orange County tracked for MLS are down 11% for the year so far, and there's really not much hope of showing improvement on that because inventory levels are also down 47% with only about one and a half months of supply. But I will say that that is, you know, it is partly thanks to the lack of that resale inventory, that demand for new home construction has been going crazy. Um, tracking the types of home sales going back to 20, 2015, we can see that five years ago in the triangle market, new home sales made up about 21% of all the home sales, all the, of all the homes that were sold that year. And already now, year to date, we are seeing that that market share has grown to about 27% of all the homes sold so far are now, are those new homes. Um, and this is actually one metric that sets us apart. Let me go back one more. It does set us apart from a lot of our peer cities across the country with really only Austin, Texas, boosting a higher percentage of new home sales with close to 33% of their market share. Um, in Charlotte, for example, the new homes account for only about 18% of the market share. So in the Triangle region is really where builders know that they have a, a favorable market and they can um, a, a strong pool of buyers and um, opportunities for growth. So for the triangle as a whole, we are right now building about 13,000 new homes every year. Our markets peaked back in 2006. The builders were, uh, we topped out at about 17,000 homes that were under construction at any one time. That bubble, of course, burst in 2007, leading to the start of the Great Recession in 2008, when our market bottomed out to just under 5,000 housing units that were started that year. Uh, but even today, nearly 15 years later, we're still nowhere near back to where we were at that market peak. Of course, looking in that rearview mirror, we now know we didn't need that many homes back then, so maybe this is not such a bad thing. But this overabundance of caution among the financial markets and the home builders still carrying those scars from the Great Recession is what we have now is a shortage of housing options adequate enough to support the surge in the buyer demand that we've been talking about and that we've been experiencing since May. And the data I'm showing you here reflects only our market's demand reflected through mid-June when our surveyors were finishing up our spring report. For forecasting, the third quarter data is going to show us that quarterly new housing starts could be up as much as 30% or more. The big question is, well, how long is this going to last? So because our tracking for June, July, and August for pending new home sales has been off the chart. So this is our evaluation of the builder markets of the pre-sales that they have coming on, the houses that, are, that they've sold for quick move-ins, but also those homes that will never come to market because they've already been sold. July was, June was great. July was better. And August, it turns out, was even better with our latest Myers Research New Home Pending Sales Index that came out yesterday showing that sales nationally are up about 40% compared to August of last year. And the triangle was even stronger, showing that we had 57% year-over-year growth impending sales in August. 
So September and October, we'll have to see. This is traditionally when home sales in our market slow down a bit as schools are back in session and fewer people are traveling, but this year is of course different. Um, but the information that I am hearing out in the field is that sales are still going strong, maybe not quite as strong as July and August when some builders were setting new records for themselves, but it should still keep a pretty steady pace ahead of last year for the rest of this calendar year. So breaking out, I talked about the market share of the triangle compared to other major metros across the country. This is breaking out our triangle region in more detail by counties, showing what the market share is for new homes. And you'll see here that in Chatham County, new home sales make up about 23% of all the county's home sales with a big chunk of that coming at Briar Chapel. And these are pretty strong numbers compared to a statewide average that's about 10 to 12%. Um, however, Chatham County 2017, three years ago, had a, a, about 33% of their home sales were coming from new home communities. So the new home construction has obviously slacked off a bit. Orange County also has few new home communities under construction, but new home sales still accounted for about 15% of all the home sales in the county since January, which compares to five years ago when only about 9% of the market share were for new homes. So diving deeper, as I promised, into the local data for just Chapel Hill and Carborough. Here's our ranking and a map of some of the locations of the 10 most active new home communities in this geographic region. Briar Chapel accounting for about 45% of all the new housing starts in the region over the last 12 months and about 32% of all the new home closings, followed by Legacy at Jordan Lake with about 34 new home closings in the last 12 months and Westfall with 26. And I know there's a lot of information on this particular side, but I'll kind of walk you through what it shows. And this is capturing only our data from those Chapel Hill and Carborough zip codes that I had in that map I showed earlier. The chart on the left is our trend line of annual starts and closings going back to the year 2000. And you can see the activity in recent months has dropped back down to a lot of the same levels we had coming out of the recession. Annual starts are down 12% as of our second quarter survey. Annual closings are down 15%. The chart on the right shows all of the new home construction inventory that we have in our database. And you can see that the corresponding decline in the number of new homes that are either under construction, finished, vacant, or a model. Right now, there's about 6.4 months of supply in, of new construction inventory, which really is about in line with where the market balance conditions should be for our region. But I would also argue that the only reason that it seems like demand from buyers has slowed is because they really don't have very many options to choose from in, in the Chapel Hill Carver area on the new home construction side. So for Orange County specifically, uh, we're you know, similar trend lines. We've seen a slowdown and a drop going back over the last 12 months. Um, annual starts down almost 20%, closings down 8%, expecting closings to continue to slow because you see last quarter we had quarterly starts significantly down compared to a year ago. And if we don't have houses that are starting and uh, we don't have houses that can be sold. Chatham County, a little bit stronger uptick we're starting to see because we've got the first houses inside Chatham Park that are now underway. Many of them, they'll actually be on the tour once the Parade of Homes kicks off next weekend. So looking ahead, how just how sustainable do we think this V-shaped housing recovery would be? Uh, for the short term, it is looking very favorable for those who are investing and building in the home building market. Uh, maybe not so favorably in the short term for those in the commercial real estate industries, as there's not a lot of new leasing deals that are coming through the pipeline right now as companies are still trying to figure out um, what next year is going to look like. But in the long term, I still feel it's going to be very, a very favorable environment for both residential and commercial real estate as we are adjusting to these changes and, cho and, cha and choices that are being made during the pandemic. It's really this medium term that we're scratching our heads as to what's going to be happening for how long we're going to be able to sustain this level of activity, particularly when we're facing a lack of inventory that's going to really put a cap on how much that we can really grow. Um, and then maybe that's not such a bad thing, you know, as I had mentioned, you know, we, we did get a little ahead of our skis back in 06 and 07, but will we be able to keep up with the demand without home prices skyrocketing even further out of reach of the average household income? That's really one of the big questions that's going to be driving a lot of our conversations 
because we know that other problems in the past are coming back as we are seeing home prices rise. The NAHB estimates that for every $1,000 increase to an average home price, about 60,000 people nationally are priced out of being able to buy a home. Molly Carmichael, she's one of the principals with our Myers Research Team, and she leads our Consumer Research Division and surveys hundreds of new home buyer, homeowners and potential homeowners each year as part of her research. And her surveys are still showing that affordability of a home is still the top of mind for all the buyers. Now, affordability is also in the eye of the beholder. For one family, a $250,000 home might be what they want, but feel it's out of their reach. But for another, it might be a $450,000 home that's just out of their reach. But what Molly also notes is that very low on that concern list is a worry that they're carrying, that we're carrying too much debt or that they might have an unstable job position. So for the most part, people are still very confident in the real estate markets right now. And we've also been conducting our own sentiment survey of the local home building division presidents on a monthly basis. I've been doing it here for the Raleigh market. And last week we asked um, our builders how many had increased their base prices in their communities in September. In August, we had 87% um, admitting that they had raised prices. This month it was 92%. And I think next month we'll see that it'll probably be closer to 100% because we are seeing huge spikes in lumber industry right now. It's really been an, an, an upheaval going back to the spring when lumber futures hit a four year low, when the sawmills closed down in response to the pandemic, when they reopened, the price began to rise and it really hasn't stopped. Between April and mid-September, lumber prices have gone up nearly 160% which the NAHB estimates adds about $16,000 to the cost of the price of building a new single family home on a national level. The good news is, is that in the last few days, we have seen lumber futures start to come back down to about the same level we were in July. But for, these are pricing estimates that are lumber futures. So it could still be November, December, even January before the lumber prices that are being quoted at the lumber yard, the ones where the builders are buying, at the Home Depot, at the local lumber mill, when they start to come back down. We also asked the builders about any other supply disruptions that could impact their goals and their sales for their plans into next year, into 2021. At the top of their list, appliances windows, siding, and cabinets. If you've not been, been paying attention, there are severe shortages for a lot of these that is really impacting the delivery of homes on time. Because a lot of the components that are that go into these products um, are having to be imported and they're being delayed because of the ships that are having to come over from Asia and the delays that, that were over there. There's also a mix of domestic products that might be in shorter supply because manufacturing hit, hit plants were hit by some of the shutdowns related to COVID. One of the Charlotte builders I talked to last week um, uh, said that they were close to selling two houses in the next two weeks and neither one of those houses had HVAC units installed yet and their supplier did not know when they would be arriving. I have heard stories of custom builders who have had to go out and rent appliances to put into their homes in order to make their deadlines for their buyers and to be able to move forward. So these are issues that we're, we're watching, we're paying attention to. Uh, likewise, we asked them about any, um, a, a, any delays in government services and nearly 70% of the builders responded that they are seeing delays created because municipalities are still virtual or they're trying a hybrid approach, but it is affecting getting pl plats approved, getting um, building permits approved and moving forward. And evaluating the shift in new and existing home prices here in the triangle, you can see that the sector really has been increasing. But one of the things that I kind of, I've been tracking, you know, to date, really the, the new home price is going on an average about 2.4% and that gap between new and existing has been shrinking. It's now at about 26% between the new and existing home prices. But keep in mind also that um, that's about $80,000 that builders still need to prove that a new home is worth more than an existing home. But it's a lot easier to make that argument when there's not as many options that are out there. So how does this relate to housing affordability? Well, it could be worse. Um, right now, about 54% of the population can realistically afford to buy an existing home at the median, current median price. It helps that interest rates have remained low and are expected to remain low, but it, and it also helps that the average weekly earnings have been rising, partly in thanks to that extra $600 in federal government for the unemployment that uh, through the, but that 
back through the end of July, but those dollars have dried up and unemployment is still stubbornly high. So I think we can start seeing those earning rates start to level back out before the end of the year. Watching what's happening on the mortgage markets a little bit closer, this is that other shoe that we're hoping will not draw. Um, it helps that the federal moratorium on foreclosures and evictions have been extended through at least the end of December on loans that are backed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Freddie Mac. And based on the data that's coming out of Black, out of Black Knight, um, the delinquency rate has improved with fewer people in that, on that uh, on, in the delinquency rate, but the serious delinquencies are those that are 90 days or more past due is going up. It's up about 20%. So this is something that bears watching. The multifamily apartment market is likely to be tested a bit in the coming months as it's likely to begin feeling pressure coming from two different directions. One are those apartment tenants who might have lost their jobs due to the pandemic and might be having trouble making those monthly payments and might be looking for cheaper options for housing. And two, the other pressure pointing coming from tenants who still are very much gainfully employed and now are voluntarily deciding to break their lease to go out and buy a new home. According to the research from our own Myers Research Group, overall occupancy in the triangle fell to about 94% in the second quarter. She's projecting that occupancy could fall even further to around 93% by the second quarter next year. Um, this is the first time in a long time that we're seeing some moderation, though, in rental rates, which was down slightly about 0.8% the second quarter. But the trend to keep an eye on will be what property managers are offering to potential new tenants in the way of concessions. Last quarter, close to 27% of the apartment communities were offering some sort of concession on new lease contracts. And on average, those concessions were equal to about a 3.5% discount. So, you know, currently our market has about 8,100 new units that are under construction, about another 5,300 that are expected to be delivered in the next 12 months. Um, that additional inventory could create a temporary glut of new units as demand for new apartments has fallen to this four-year low, but the blip is expected to only be temporary because in talking with, you know, some of the engineers and architects, Investors and apartments are still very bullish on this market, and they're especially in the suburban areas where they can build some of these more mid-rise um, and garden-style appointment of apartments that people still feel safe in. So based on projected job growth and pipeline expectations, um, we do believe that occupancy, the occupancy will fall in the short run, but start to improve by 2023. And on the topic, um, you know, on that same topic, one of the questions we asked our builders was about net migration and where they're seeing their buyers coming from. And crazy enough, I mean, we're not surprised about New York, New Jersey. Florida is another one that I'm hearing a lot of people moving here from. But I am also hearing from some of our builders, they are seeing a lot of people coming from California um, who were trying to, to, to escape the craziness that's happening over there and their high tax rates and all of everything else that's happening there. But we're going to kind of have to watch this trend to see if it continues on. So now forecasting forward, I am expecting new home starts and closings in the triangle to finish the year up about five to six percent year over year. It would be higher if we had more inventory on the ground, but because of the delays in getting some of these plats and permits approved, many of these sales are being pushed into 2021 instead. Uh, Rob Dietz, the chief economist for the National Association of Home Builders, is still forecasting that new home starts in 2020 will be down about 1% compared to last year, but he also believes that we'll likely close out the year on the upside of that number. And he's projecting single family permits in North Carolina will be up about 11%. Non-residential permits, however, will be more impacted by this slowdown in the economy, at least for the next, for the, the next 12 months or so as the market is adjusting to the different priorities that have surfaced as a result of the pandemic. So I wanted to close out with some other good news. It's not necessarily all real estate related. Um, I, many of you may have heard and met El Ellie. This is the local golden retriever who has taken the internet by storm. Um, after one of the team members of the new Chick-fil-A at Caraway Villas posted a video of Ellie running across the parking lot to pick up her owner's bag of Chick-fil-A sandwiches that he had placed as a curbside order. After the video was posted, it went viral. It's got picked up by multiple national media outlets around the country and has brought great notori notoriety for Ellie and for the Chapel Hill area. And more good news is that the downtown Chapel Hill partnership continues to update its list of business openings in the business district. As of last night, about 69 of the 85 downtown Chapel Hill eat and drink places 
uh, that are being tracked have been confirmed open for business in some form or fashion. And considering the considerable odds that are facing many of these local business owners and operators, I think this is definitely a cause for celebration. So let's all mask up and support our local businesses. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Every year I look forward to it. Every year I have incredibly high expectations. <laughs> Every year you deliver. Um, and that was absolutely fabulous. There are very few presentations that we do at the chamber where I want to go back and watch it again. Uh, that will be on my list. Um, if we were able to applaud you, we would. Maybe it's uh, <laughs> some way to appreciate uh, your exceptional, really exceptional work. Uh, for those of you who joined uh, late, and I saw about maybe 15, 20 of you all came in mid-presentation, uh, and for those who want to share this with their staff uh, or team members, Vanessa is going to send out a link. You'll get the full presentation, both the slide deck without um, the uh, delivery and presentation, as well as this video that you can share with others. All right, let's pivot to a panel. That was really fabulous. Take a deep breath, process some of that, and we're going to bring forward uh, three local experts to talk a little bit about what they're up to and to react on whether um, what they're seeing on the ground. So first, we're going to have Joe Dye of Grub Properties. Grub Properties has been in business since 1963. They own and manage and are developing several properties in our community, including uh, Glen Lennox. Uh, the Link Apartments is up and we'll be taking folks in very shortly. The Gwendolyn, a uh, 100,000 square foot office building, he'll tell us more about, uh, under construction, and then um, a renovation redevelopment of 137 East Franklin and 136 uh, Rosemary, which you all may remember is the CBS building or Nations Bank Plaza or NCNB Plaza. Uh, Joe is uh, executive vice president there. Before he presents, let me just uh, introduce the other uh, speakers. We'll have Ashley Salpa with Ram Realty Advisors. Ram owns University Place, formerly University Mall, um, as well as a newly constructed um, apartment building, the Elliott, as well as the retail establishments behind uh, the Elliott there on Elliott Drive. He is their Director of Investments. And then we will hear also from Terry Turner. She's the Vice Chair of our Government Affairs Committee. She is a partner in Weaver Street Realty, uh, headquartered in Carborough and a local uh, real estate expert. Um, let's go with Joe. Joe, um, who you, and for uh, those of you out there, again, if you use the um, speaker view, you'll get a chance to see Joe. If you would unmute yourself, um, bring welcome, and then tell us a little bit of what you guys are up to and react to some of what Amanda had talked about. Sure. Thank you, Aaron, and good morning, everyone. Appreciate all the partners and sponsors for today's event. Appreciate Aaron being having the invite to speak. I appreciate Amanda turning off the fire hose of information. That was a, a lot to unpack, but fantastic presentation as always, uh, and uh, a lot of great information. Uh, I took a bunch of notes, and I, I'm going to kind of go through my list of reaction to Amanda's presentation. Number one, focusing on housing, and my forte is more commercial but the affordability component is a, you know, very serious. And what are we thinking or how are we thinking about that in Chapel Hill? Uh, number one, or one of our most important investments this year is in the 300th Habitat home. We're partnering with Habitat for Humanity of Orange County. We're building that home in the North Side neighborhood uh, this fall and very pleased to be working with them and uh, bringing yet another uh, affordable home to the Orange County and Chapel Hill community. And then what are we doing primarily at our Glen Lennox community where we have the existing patio homes and we're uh, thinking through envisioning a long-term redevelopment of Glen Lennox. And what does that look like? Uh, one is we've uh, uh, created what we call a vested renter program. We piloted that here at Glen Lennox. We've transferred that to all of our apartment communities in the Southeast and beyond. Uh, that is for folks that are with us for five years or longer. We cap their rent growth. That CPI is a way of controlling and, and keeping their rent growth uh, in check for those residents who stay with us. They can transfer that if they move from community to community in our portfolio. And then really our Link Apartments communities have proven pretty resilient uh, in this downturn and COVID environment. And a big part of that, uh, what we call small A affordability is focusing on uh, AMI, adjusted area or area median income. 
we're really trying to hit 60 to 80 percent of that. You could call that workforce housing or affordable housing for young professionals, uh, folks that are new moving to an area, uh, workforce housing for someone who might be a nurse or a fireman or a first responder, and folks in, in that category that can attain housing in that 60-80% AMI. Uh, and that's a, a feature or some a focus for us is delivering you know, modern housing in our like apartment communities, but giving them that affordable component where they can live in the communities that they serve. Uh, focusing then on uh, some of Amanda's comments on commercial, uh, one of her slides is on, that were identified as a top mid-size uh, city. And we all know the accolades that we've enjoyed for a long period of time. Um, you know, that's a market, uh, those are the markets we focus on. Uh, we're invested in Northern Virginia. It's a resilient market. We actually have recently invested in Columbus, Ohio, which is another city that was on Amanda's slide. That's a, a safe state or seat of state government. Um, there's a flagship university there. We enjoy three here, obviously, with the UNC, Duke, and North Carolina State. Uh, and we feel like that poises the uh, Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill market um, for the benefit from this recovery. And our focus in Chapel Hill and our big bet on Chapel Hill is to restore it to a natural equilibrium to the market. And Durham has enjoyed a great resiliency and a great 12, 10 to 12 year run coming out of the Great Recession, as has downtown Raleigh. Chapel Hill has not benefited to the same degree, and we have to be part of restoring that equilibrium for Chapel Hill. Um, and there's a big focus coming out of this too. Again, a lot of what Amanda spoke to, life sciences, research, CROs, tech companies. We view UNC and Innovate Carolina component of UNC as great partners in that. They don't have to be the sole tenant, but the attraction of those types of tenants to a UNC quality university, we feel creates great opportunity both at Glen Lennox and downtown for the properties that we're looking at. Um, yeah, what's the, the state of our current market? I view it as a not if, but when. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market and folks are sitting on the sidelines. Amanda covered a lot of that in her presentation. Um, yeah, whatever side of it you're on, we're in an election year that gives folks pause by default. Uh, we're in the COVID crisis, we all know that. And I, I think we all have COVID fatigue at some level or another. Uh, and the social unrest we've seen uh, across the country through the summer uh, has got a lot of folks uh, worried about other things. I think once we get past the election, whoever wins that, uh, you know, folks will hopefully move on. And uh, one of my favorite phrases here of late is, is looking through the curve. I'm trying to take the optimist view and saying, okay, where do we come out on the other side of that? And I feel like 2021 and uh, going ahead to 2022, we will uh, be, do very well in our market. Can you um, say a little bit about what you all, your project specifically, put some visuals? Yeah, on? so um, that's perfect segue. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Hopefully you all can see that. We cannot yet see that. So I have to click that share button. That's, that's always right. a- There you go, perfect. Okay, <laughs> so We'll talk a few minutes and then I'll turn it back, uh, turn the mic back to you, Aaron. So we have some investments in downtown Chapel Hill. Make sure I'm on the right slide. So starting with the properties you mentioned, a lot of folks know it as a CVS building. Depending on your vintage, you might think of it as the Nations Bank building or HDNB building. This is 137 Franklin and 136 Rosemary. So this is a vision of what that redevelopment looks like, the new facade um, on, right on Franklin Street across from Fort Hall Alley and 136 Rosemary, really uh, re-envisioning that as a new uh, curtain wall building, uh, very modern, all new HVAC, all new electrical, really taking it to what we feel would be a class A standard. So this is a, a view of what an interior space might look like an overview of some of those amenities. Again, all new interiors, all new HVAC, new electrical, really catering to the types of companies we hope to, and, and businesses we hope to uh, bring to downtown Chapel Hill, excuse me. And then here's a profile of the building. And then some of the projects you all may have heard about and one that Amanda referenced. And this is just a, a view of what that looks like. Again, here's 136 Rose, uh, sorry, Rosemary 137 Franklin. 
And then this is the vision of the partnership we are working on with the town of Chapel Hill to create a new municipal deck that really opens up this 100 block of East Rosemary. There was great vision and leadership by Orange County and the town of Chapel Hill to recognize this particular census tract area as an opportunity zone that allows us to bring capital to bear to vision this type of redevelopment in downtown Chapel Hill where it's sorely needed, we feel. So we've been working with the town for a number of months on the opportunity to build this consolidated parking deck. It really consolidates parking in this 100 block so we can achieve a greater vision over time. And that is reimagining 136 and 137 is this innovation hub again, bringing to bear a large public parking facility that serves greater downtown, will serve the university, and also frees up some of the southern land for redevelopment. And the, at the end of that rainbow, we are working with the town and hope to achieve a new lab office building in place where the Wallace deck is today. That would be approximately 200,000 square feet. We view that as having a life sciences or research component to bring those jobs to downtown Chapel Hill uh, to bring those key uh, technology and life science players uh, close to the university where they want to be. And then here again is another uh, conceptual image of what we're trying to work on. Uh, 136 Rosemary is on your right, and this is a vision or conceptual rendering of that future lab office building that we hope to work with the town to uh, bring it town over the next three to five years. And then transitioning out to our investments in Glen Lennox. Uh, you mentioned the Gwendolyn office building that's underway right now. That will deliver in January of next year. Uh, it's a modern uh, new class A four-story building, 25,000 square foot floor plates. It will be LEED certified. We'll have the fitness center. We'll have a cafe. You can kind of see here on the far right corner. Uh, and this is a, uh, in conjunction with our Link Linda community, you can see here on the left. Together with our leasing partners, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, that team, we're bringing what we call a town hall concept. So the upper floors are large floor plates. We hope to bring larger users or have the opportunity to bring larger users to downtown or to Chapel Hill, excuse me. But we really focus with the JLL team on what is the sweet spot of tenancy in our market, people that come here or people that are already here that may need new office space. And that really generated was, or was the genesis of this town hall concept. All of this has been designed around a post-COVID environment. So more automation uh, or touchless or, or touch-friendly surfaces, social distance spacing on the floor plans and layouts you see here, and then common amenities that appeal to tenants uh, of this size. And then a couple slides on our Link Linden Apartments community that will deliver here toward the end of the year, uh, we have to bring uh, residents and uh, students and others in as early as the first part of next year when we return for uh, semester two. Uh, and then a couple slides of what that does that look like. The top left is a typical link apartment interior. Uh, the top right is the new clubhouse. You might also see off 15501 and the amenities there. The obvious and necessary yoga room we all know and enjoy, and then the interior of the clubhouse. Uh, focusing on Link Linden is a, a nod to um, Lucien Day, who was a famous designer, woman designer in the 1950s. So you see some of her fabrics on display, and the wood elements and interiors are reclaimed wood from the Glen Lennox development. And with that, I will turn the mic back to you. I really appreciate that presentation, particular to see that vision for downtown and Rosemary Street, the perspective that you offered um, on how a life science building next to what you are uh, redeveloping now and the potential for that tremendous parking structure for our community. I'm really grateful for your investment in choosing to invest in our community now and to the town of Chapel Hill, who's been partnering with you all along the way. Um, if there are questions about that, we'll come back to him in just a minute. Let's go to Ashley uh, with Ram Realty Advisors. You tell us a little bit about what you are up to and some of your reactions to the presentation that Amanda gave. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Aaron, and uh, thank you all for having me. Um, Amanda, great presentation. Um, 
I'm Ashley Sopal with RAM. RAM focuses primarily on multifamily and uh, retail. And so uh, I can touch on, on those and, and how they relate to us, I guess, starting with multifamily. Um, what we've seen in our portfolio is um, it's remained pretty strong. Um, we've had uh, just the COVID impacts, I guess, since March, we've had uh, about a 98% collection rate. And I think the national average uh, is around 95, 96%. Um, so certainly less uh, impacted than some other industries, particularly retail. Um, and then just our outlook uh, going forward uh, is, you know, we think it's going to remain strong. Um, the population growth in the Carolinas, in Charlotte, and the Triangle is about two times the national average. And then uh, when you combine that with just the, the Triangle's highly educated talent pool, uh, top tier universities that continue to feed that talent pool and um, the the below average cost of doing business we think um, that'll help continue to uh, fuel the the job growth um, so when you have those two things and um, and then other factors like household formation happening later in life with uh, millennials getting married later, having kids later, uh, that often translates into uh, those folks renting longer. And then you touched on the, uh, the single family market, the for sale market, um, and, and that sector remaining to be really strong. Um, when you have renters that are often uh, transitioning to buying, they're, they're almost always first time home buyers. And so that creates you know, an intimidating, stressful, and, and just a difficult situation, which also ends up translating into uh, them staying renters for longer. So all of that is to say, you know, we think the, the multifamily uh, sector is going to remain strong. There are some concessions right now that um, I think you, you touched on it. 2023 is, is um, when we think they'll, they'll be um, uh, sort of stabilization normalization those those uh, concessions will burn off um, but us and and most developers have have um, underwritten those and accounted for those in in the short term so uh, there really shouldn't be too much impact in in that sector uh, and then going to retail uh, not quite the same story um, the uh, you know the impact from covid we can all see um, the, the business closures, you know, some of our favorite restaurants, retails, shuttering for good. And um, I think the thing that I'm most closely following is where e-commerce sales go in 2021. Um, there's been a huge jump in the second quarter, you know, as expected with, with folks um, quarantining and staying at home um, and just March and April with uh, many uh, of the retailers forced closed. And so uh, e-commerce, which has, has typically grown, you know, 1% a year, fairly consistently uh, jumped 5% uh, year over year in the second quarter, up to 16%. And so um, what I'm looking at is what happens in 2021. Does that creep back down to, to where it would normal, normally be, or does that stay up there? because um, that has a huge impact on, on brick and mortar retail. And then I think one thing uh, that pre-COVID I hadn't um, really focused on or been aware of is um, the fitness sector. And I think, you know, a lot of us probably have Pelotons um, or have been using app-based fitness while uh, fitness centers have been forced closed. And, um, Fitness is a sector that, that's gotten increasingly crowded uh, with all the boutique and specialty fitness concepts that have emerged over the last few years. And so how, how sticky is, is the app-based and at-home fitness um, once things start to normalize? Um, that may have a, a pretty big impact on, on the sector if, if it continues to uh, be successful. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously all that's to say retail has, has certainly seen a lot more impact than multifamily and probably will continue to. Um, we're pretty heavily invested in, in retail and, and 
in Chapel Hill in particular. As Aaron mentioned, we have University Place. We also own Elliott Square, which is the O2 Fitness anchored center on, on Elliott Road. Um, and so that's something we're, we're watching extremely close. Um, I can talk a little bit about our current projects here. If you give me a sec and I will share my screen. That'd be great. And then Terry, we're gonna come to you for some reaction in just a moment on, um, on the housing market. So hopefully you all can see that. Um, you can, it looks great. Great, so we have uh, two active projects right now, um, one multifamily project and one uh, retail project. So the first is uh, the Elliott at Blue Hill. And so the Elliott at Blue Hill is a um, 272 unit multifamily uh, project along 15501 right at Elliott Road and within the Blue Hill District. Uh, and so the inspiration for this project and, and a lot of the design elements um, came from researching the, the history behind uh, Elliott Road's name, uh, which was from Stephen Elliott, a, um, a, a famous botanist um, who had a pretty big impact in, in Chapel Hill and at UNC. And so we tried to take some of those elements uh, and apply them to the project. So you'll see um, in our interior design, uh, we've incorporated a lot of that. We've um, oriented the building to maximize the units that uh, face the um, Booker Creek Greenway. And we've also uh, partnered with the town on a public-private uh, partnership to um, enhance that Greenway Trail. And so uh, that project's underway and um, that'll improve connectivity uh, in adding uh, trails. Um, it'll also add public art, and then we'll be increasing the uh, flood storage capacity there. So um, that should finish up here soon, and that'll be a great amenity for the town and for the apartment project, too. Um, we did just deliver our first units at the Elliott and um, had move-in start about two weeks ago. And uh, we're putting the, um, the finishing touches on our amenity spaces and should be finished up with our construction here pretty shortly. Uh, just down the road from that, we have University Place, which is at uh, 15501 and Estes Drive. And so um, we bought this property about 18 months ago uh, with the business plan to effectively demall it. Um, we all know the story with, with malls uh, in the general sense um, and uh, university place is really no exception. And so our plan to demall really uh, to simplify is to, to convert as much of the interior mall to exterior. And so we started that with our first phase of renovations, which um, you can see on the bottom left where uh, the spaces next to Bar Taco were renovated and converted uh, from interior space to exterior space. Um, we're at least with one tenant uh, and are negotiating on the other. Uh, you see on the right side of that image, we have Hawkers. They've been open since March now. Uh, did a fantastic job on the renovations there. The tenant did. And we, uh, in addition to creating those new two, two new suites, excuse me, we, um, we also renovated another 12,000 feet on the SD's fronting side. Um, and so that was really the first phase of what our larger plan is. Our second phase and the larger redevelopment um, is really continuing that. And uh, just the, the orientation and configuration of the mall, you can really only flip so much uh, from interior to exterior without leaving a, a, a big dead space in the middle. So um, what we're planning is to, to demo a portion of the existing mall and, uh, and create additional exterior suites uh, from what's now effectively the, the, the center of the mall, the interior of the mall. And along with that, we'll create this new uh, main street, what we're calling it, which is a pedestrian focused uh, street with, um, with all retail facing storefronts, um, as well as some green space. And you can see a few green spaces on the plan there. That's gonna be a big focus, um, not only just adding green space, but activating it and having a significant amount of um, uh, outdoor amenity space with various uses, um, one being the uh, permanent home for the, the Chapel Hill Farmers Market. Um, along with the renovations of the existing property, we have um, 
uh, an SCP or rezoning uh, that is underway. And, um, and what that'll do is allow, um, you see sort of two pods uh, on the site plan, one facing Willow, one fronting Fordham. And those will be uh, where the development is focused if that uh, rezoning is approved. Um, and what that'll likely include is um, multifamily in the initial phase, um, uh, along with some retail. Um, and then as, as market conditions improve and we start to normalize, we could also um, include hospitality and office. And so timing on this, we are, um, as I mentioned, uh, underway on the, the SUP um, modification. Um, we're hoping that uh, that's approved and we're able to start here in 2021, uh, which would have us delivering in 2023. That's fabulous, Ashley. Uh, thank you. Sure. The University Place, we're just getting used to calling it that rather than University Mall, and it's exciting to see you present such a new vision for what is possible. I also want to congratulate you on innovation in a very Chapel Hill appropriate way at your apartments at the Elliott. Um, for those of you to know, they are seeking an artist in residence, um, a way to bring uh, a person immersed in the arts into the property to help make it um, a real extraordinary living environment. Terry Turner, I'm coming to you um, from Weaver Street Realty. Can you talk to us a little bit about your reaction on what you're seeing in the home sales uh, market? Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Amanda. That was an amazing, uh, 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 gosh, I'm blanking on the word. Um, anyway, it was fabulous. And Aaron, like you, I'm going to go back and rewatch it. You gave us a lot of information. Um, the market is very brisk. Uh, you, Amanda mentioned Moody's and the triangle be ident being identified as a place where corporations and growth is going to happen. And uh, I'm seeing that as well. A lot of people are moving here from other parts of the world and companies are coming here. So I predict that the market will stay very brisk. Um, the highest volume of sales happens in that range up to 350,000. Uh, not surprisingly, what we're seeing is the upsizers and downsizers are competing for the same inventory, which makes that price point very competitive. Uh, multiple offers, uh, prices are above list price. Uh, people come here, the, the prices here are reasonable relative to other areas. Um, so that is actually impacting appraisals a little bit where, where banks are tightening up a little bit. Um, with COVID and unemployment and uh, job security being less secure, banks are tightening up. Uh, they're wanting more down payments, uh, higher credit scores, um, and they're being a little more careful about evaluating things. So that is something that's happening. Um, uh, Amanda, you mentioned that the construction area was one of our bright spots in our economy with some job growth. And I did a little research, the raw land sales from year over year sales have gone up 20%. And that's a mix of small lots and subdivisions to lots, uh, you know, just out on Orange Grove Road. So there's a very increased demand for land uh, and, you know, hopefully some more houses. And um, I was I was surprised that you said that the uh, rental rates had fallen because uh, one of the things I'm seeing are sellers recognizing what demand there is for their homes. Sellers are choosing to move into apartments to put their house on the market uh, for two reasons. A, that there's a great amount of apartments here. They're beautiful. Uh, but also there's nowhere for them to move, but they've outgrown their house and they're willing to make these small adjustments and take advantage of the amenities that a lot of these apartment communities offer, the gym, the pool, uh, office space on site. So when you're living at home and you've outgrown your home, the apartments are becoming something that serves all their needs. So I predict the rental rates will, will level out and, and maybe, you know, the, the, uh, the vacancies will, will decrease. Um, so it's, it's a vibrant market. I don't think it's going to slow down. 
uh, people will continue to come here. Um, our economic drivers aren't going away. And, um, so it's a great place to live. So that's what I'm seeing. Harry, that's super helpful. Are you seeing any challenges with appraisals? So uh, normally appraisers are not quick to the market, right? So there's huge pressure, but they're still trying to find comps from uh, eight months ago or 10 months ago. Are properties not appraising? Is that becoming a problem of transactions? Yeah, I'm seeing that. I'm, I'm personally in, and I've talked to some of my colleagues, um, and it's affecting homes and raw land uh, because people are so... Um, keen to buy a home, they are, they, you know, multiple offers, $10,000, $20,000 over list price, and that keeps escalating, and there isn't data to support it. Appraisers are trying really hard. It's a hard time to be an appraiser, but, but it, is, it is becoming more of a problem where a bank is, is saying we can't find justification for the contract price here particularly the national banks that sell their loans, the Fannie and Freddie underwritten loans. Our local credit unions have a little more flexibility because they don't sell their loans um, and they recognize our local market. Uh, they have a, a better knowledge of it. So I'm, I'm on team credit union for sure. <laughs> no offense <laughs> to any of our local bankers. It's just they, they, have, they can be a little more nimble. <laughs> um. Let me now turn to the group. Um, I put myself in back in gallery view. I suggest you do the same. That makes us all look like a Brady Bunch. Uh, Katie, are there any questions in the chat or would anybody like to put their hand up and ask a question? Aaron, there has been um, at least one question in the chat and it was from Desiree Goldman. She was wondering about what percentage of new house uh, sales were under $350,000. I know Terry was touching on that a bit. Is there anything the panel might be able to say to that? I have that data. Um, Desiree, we can get right back. I, well, the question for you all, do you know the answer to that for these last nine months? I have it for uh, the previous 12 months. I do uh, not. Desiree, the state of the community report, which I know you uh, participated in, there's some of that information is there. That's a good point to ask. We're hearing from people who are buyer's reps trying to help the first time home buyer find anything in this market, uh, a real challenge. Um, not able to find the product that they need locally. Desiree, I appreciate the consistency. I think that now you are uh, 10 for 10 on a question in the last 10 policy series. I, I rely on you <laughs> to have good questions and thank you for your comments last night. Yeah. And Erin, uh, Jennifer Player from Habitat also has a question. She's asking if anyone has insight into the condo market locally. Um, we can crowdsource that. Any of the panelists or anybody else on the call? Are there any uh, condos available right now? <laughs> There's really not much new construction on the condo side. I've been hearing chatter from developers that are interested in approaching condos, but it, it, it goes back to the financing and the banks and the approvals that they still need and the pre-sales and such. And if they're building the larger ones with 50 units or more, they still need that 50% pre-sale. And it's been untested since pre-Great Recession. So there's not as many investors who are willing to take that risk. I think that there is definitely a demand for it, but it is trickier. I'm still seeing more multifamily rentals than I'm seeing on the condo side across the Carolinas. It's not just here. Locally, we have more townhouse than condo, um, yeah. but we do have uh, some condo. They do go quickly. I heard a story just yesterday, a townhouse in Carbro priced at $240,000, two bedroom, two bath, four offers above asking price. Prior to really being listed, it was coming soon and offers sight unseen um, with not yet having done the professional photography. I want to share in the chat, um, we talked a little bit about businesses that are forced closed and how struggle there's been in retail. Yesterday, the governor announced a $40 million fund to help support businesses that have not yet allowed to be open. It's ncommerce.com slash M-U-R-R. That stands for uh, mortgage, something, rent, and something else. But essentially for the uh, bars or bowling alleys or movie theaters, it covers up to four months of mortgage or four months of rent, up to $20,000. It's a grant. It'll be first come, first served, and it will open next week. The 
you get an email from me, uh, please do share it with your friends or check that site out. Um, we've had some questions about the impact of students being here, not being here on our local housing and rental market. Um, got a question myself from uh, try, um, folks, higher education magazines, what's uh, life like in Chapel Hill with the students gone? And the answer is they aren't. Uh, campus is, you know, they went from taking five class, four classes online and one in person to taking five classes online. And while our residence halls uh, have reduced their down to 1,000 people, the 20,000 students that lived off campus already have mostly remained. We are seeking some data on general occupancy. We did see some shifting around. The people who did go home, the sublease market was wild, but at the moment, the um, de-densification of campus, students moving into some vacant off-campus, um, and so those who did go home from their off-campus housing have been backfilled by students who are moving off campus into the community. So I, I, I was talking to some university representatives, I believe we have between 17 and 20,000 students remaining uh, here in our market. Uh, the three new apartment complexes that are all coming online are coming online just now, right? We just heard uh, two weeks ago from our friends at the Elliott and Joe's project won't come on for another couple of months, but that will add some supply into our market and probably um, create a little bit of slack. Are there other questions that folks want to, we want to be respectful of your time and we try to land this at 10 o'clock uh, every time. I'm looking at all of your faces. <laughs> yep, my, my recommendation, Aaron, is that we'll need to wrap it up. Katie, I appreciate she is committed to delivering a, a meeting that <laughs> concludes on time. Thank you, Katie, for organizing a great panel uh, for us and Amanda for your exceptionalism. Katie, I'm going to bounce it to you in just a second for final uh, words. Um, but I want to say a personal thank you to Ashley um, and to Joe and to Terry uh, for your comments and then to Ashley and Joe for your substantial investments in our community. These are tough times. It would have, would have been easy for you to pull back, to choose not to build the Gwendolyn, uh, to halt your plans for a uh, university place, to slow on what you were doing downtown, but you're not. Um, you are doubling down and investing in our community and we will benefit uh, from that. And we are grateful to the rest of you for your membership in the chamber. These are tough times where we know we have to earn your investment and you have other things that you could be doing with your money. And we are committed to delivering you real value for the funds that you invest in us with our professional staff. And our goal is to help everybody navigate through this crisis and emerge successfully uh, on the other end. If there's anything that we can be doing for you, uh, please call on us individually. Um, and we look forward to serving and supporting you. Katie, final words that you'd like to offer? Yes, thank you. Well, I also want to give a heartfelt thank you to our speakers um, and Amanda for the terrific research and presentation. That was superb. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, Durham Tech, Duke Energy, and Silver Spot for bringing this policy series forward. Um, if I want to let everyone know that um, Aaron and Amanda will have a live hit on 97.9 The Hill WCHL today at 3.15. So if you tune in at 3.15, you'll hear them talking about the key takeaways from today's forum. Our next forum is the annual state legislative briefing. It's gonna be on Friday, December 4th. We have our full uh, delegation to the North Carolina General Assembly uh, confirmed to speak. We've got Representative Insko, Meyer, and Fushi, Senator Fushi confirmed. So registration is open for that and it's free for members. Um, and with that, Aaron, I, I think we are, we can call it adjourned. Thanks. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, uh, for helping uh, keep us running smoothly today. Thank you also to Jensen uh, and then the rest of Team Chamber, Rebecca and Justin on this call as well. Um, Betsy, thank you for your leadership of the Government Affairs Committee. Um, these thank yous are sort of the credits that roll as you are sort of bowing out of the meeting. <laughs> so uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, everybody have a great day. <laughs>